All right, today we're going to talk about inverse functions. So functions that take an original function and reverse it or undo it. So before we talk about that, the first thing we're going to do is review a little bit of what it means to be a function. And a function we've seen before means there are no repeat x values. And so we've seen examples like our favorite example of a parabola, no repeat x values, the vertical line test. It only hits it once. That ensures that there are no repeat x values. Each unique x has only one output. That makes it pass the vertical line test, whereas things like uh, circles are not functions because they hit that twice. Uh, a one-to-one -one function, it's still a function. The name function's in there, so it still meets this criteria of no repeat x values, but it adds the additional criteria of no repeat y values now. So in my example above, that parabola we graphed, you graph a parabola like this. Sure enough, it passes the function part, but it's going to fail the horizontal line test because um, this same y value is going to get hit. Let's say that that's four for x values of two and I don't know, something like six. So repeat x values, each x value has a, a unique y value, but the y values are not unique to individual x values, so it fails one to one. Um, and the horizontal line test tests that. Just like the vertical line test, uh, horizontal line test hits uh, the graph only once equals one to one. The criteria is met. If it hits the graph anywhere, if any ver horizontal line hits the graph more than once, it equals we do not have a one-to-one -one function like our parabola example above. So in the next page, we'll do a few examples of horizontal line tests to determine whether or not a function is allied. On the next page, we'll kind of explain what it means to be one, kind of go a little bit deeper, one-to-one -one explained, if you will. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do here is we're going to draw ourselves two graphs. On the left, we're going to draw a cubic, y equals x to the third. And on the right, we're going to draw a parabola, y equals x squared. And we're going to do so reasonably accurately here. Um, let's see. So reasonably accurately. A cubic looks kind of like that. And we know that cubics go through the point 1, 1, and negative one, negative one, so you get your points there. Now parabola, we don't need the bottom half because it kind of goes up and away, and it goes through one, one, and negative one, one, a little bit differently. So what does it mean to be one to one? Well, remember one to one means no repeat y values, no repeat y values. We already know it's a function because it has no repeat x values, but we want no repeat y values. So for our left function, we started a y value of 1, and we kind of travel over and we say, okay, that y value of 1 is related to the x value of 1 uniquely. And if we started any other different value of, of y, negative 1 for instance, and travel over, we see that that value of y is related uniquely to the x value of negative 1, and so there are no repeat ones. However, for this parabola, if we start at lots of y values, like one, for example, well, we have kind of ambiguity. We could travel to the right or to the left and hit a point on our graph. And those points, respectively, go down to two different x values. So this thing is not one to one because it has repeat y values. And this one is one to one because it has no repeat wise. So now in the next slide, let's do a couple examples of horizontal line tests to test for one-to-one. -one. Why one-to-one -one is important is coming soon. All right, so first thing we're going to see here is lots of examples. Well, we recognize this first one as our friend, the absolute value graph. This middle one, y equals x to the third. Spoiler, we did that one on the last slide. And this third one over here to the right is y equals the square root of x, things we've seen before. So horizontal line test. Just right away, your absolute value, it hits it twice, so it fails, so it is not 
a one to one function. And then now we move on to x cubed. Any horizontal line we draw only hits it once. And careful here at zero, it seems like it kind of flattens out, but still it only hits it at one place if you zoom in really, really, really close. So this one is, yes, it passes, it succeeds. So it is, yes, it is one to one. And last but not least for our, our uh, square root there as well, yes, every horizontal line only hits it once. So it is a one to one function. So one thing to note here is that one to one, as we've kind of saw in that first slide, is the quote other direction of the definition of what it means to be a function. So a function says one input, one x value to only one output y value, but it doesn't say anything about the y values they could repeat. So over here, one to one function is you take one output and then you restrict it to only, only uh, to one, uh, okay, one output to only one input in the reverse direction. And so x's go to one unique y and y's go to one unique x. And so when you put it together, each one value of either x or y goes to only one unique related value. All right, a couple more slides, because now that we've introduced this concept, the question is, well, why are we talking about one-to-one -one functions? Well, we're not yet we're in two uh, inverse functions if you look at the uh, table of contents to the left. So now we'll start talking about inverse functions. And it turns out that the second bullet point down, a function must be one-to-one -one in order to have an inverse. And we'll try, I'll try and draw a picture that kind of explains that a little bit. But so the inverse of a function reverses the original. And so let's just think about that. And let's take a look at, uh, well, let's talk about notation first. And the notation here, uh, the inverse of an original function f of x is denoted by f inverse of x. Caution, this little raised to the negative one is not an exponent. It is a piece of notation that means f, f to the, what looks like to the negative first power means inverse of the related original function of f. But so let's take a quick second, look at what it means to reverse an original function. So, and, and while we're talking about that, we'll think about why we need it to be one-to-one. -one. So let's look at one that fails. So our example that we've used that fails the one-to-one -one test is the parabola. And uh, one that passes is the cubic. Okay, so reasonably accurate graphs here. Again, that the same picture we drew before uh, with uh, one hash mark in every direction should give us a pretty good picture and some concrete points on our graphs to actually look at and consider. Okay, so for uh, an inverse to reverse an original function, well, we know how to go take an input x and go to y for any of these functions. But let's reverse that relationship. Let's start with a y value. So we'll start with a y value. And let's pick one that both of these functions hit. Well, both of these functions hit 1. So down here at the 1 to 1 function, the cubic, if I start at 1 as my y value, yeah, just looking at the graph, I can go over to the point on the graph, and I can see that 1 as a y value relates to 1 as an x value. You could think of it as y equals 1 tells us, implies that x equals 1 in the reverse order of what we usually think when we're, when we're calculating points for y equals x to the third power. Now over here on the parabola, if we did that same game, we started with y equals 1. Well, there's a bit of ambiguity here. How do I reverse the function? I want to be a function, it's got to go one. It's got to have just one related thing, but it doesn't have just one related thing. I could go to the right and I could say here that y equals one gives us a related x equals to one, or I could choose to go to the left. And green isn't good here in this case, it's just changing colors here. Um, and that would give me that y equals one is related to x equals negative one. 
And there's some ambiguity there. If, I, if I'm going to the, reverse the relationship from Y and then go back to the, real, the original X that gave me that Y, I can't have that ambiguity. I can't have two Xs. Otherwise, we can't truly reverse the relationship. And so that's why the criteria has to be that we have a one-to-one -one function. Okay, so let's talk about domains and ranges a little bit of inverse functions. If a function reverses the other, then the domains and the ranges are reversed. So let's think about it like this. Um, and let's, let's give ourselves an example. Let's think of f of x. Well, let me write that in a color. Um, f of x is equal to x to the third power. Now, I am going to tell you that that, maybe I should do that in the forward direction. Green would be a good choice of color for that. f of x equals x to the third power. Now to reverse that, we'll learn how to do this later, but I'm going to tell you that to reverse that relationship, um, f of y is equal to the third root of y. Now I'm, I'm choosing x and y here carefully and for a reason. Just roll with it uh, and hopefully it'll come out in the wash. Okay, so I am used to thinking of things in terms of domains and ranges. So for my green function, I have a domain which has in it a bunch of x values. And so we're going to choose x is equal to 2. And so we'll calculate that. f of 2 for x value gives me 2, gives me 2 to the third power, gives me 8. So the related y value, or f of 2 over here, uh, y in our range is going to be y equals f of 2 equals 8 over here. And so here's my point, here's my point, and the function f takes the input of 1, or 2 rather, and maps it to the output of 8. Now to imagine we're going to reverse this relationship. Well, our inverse function is going to take y equals 8, this same point, only now we're going to think of it as the input of our function. And when something is the input of our function, we call it the domain. And it's going to take that y equals 8. And well, let's do the math over here. f inverse of 8 is equal to the third root of 8. What times itself 3 times gives you 8? Well, 2. And that gives us an x value, an original value, with respect to the original function that we're reversing. And so the inverse takes us back home to where we started. And what do you call the result of a function? Because after all, an inverse is still a function. The resulting outputs are the range values. So over here, this x equals 2. We now think of x equals f inverse of 8 equals 2. It can be a little bit confusing, but think of it as reversing the relationship. So the summary of this is that the domain and ranges uh, are opposite when you have inverses. So the domain of the original function f is the range, the output of the reversing function f inverse, and the range of the original function f is the domain of the reversing function f inverse. So let's take a look in a little bit of example, or a little bit of detail about domains and ranges. So here are two functions. And again, I'll kind of think of as the original one is going forward and the, the inverse, there should be an of x here, the inverse function as going in the reverse direction. Now notice over here, I didn't put f inverse of y, but I put f inverse of x. And that's because it, in a way, if I didn't give you this green function over here to the left, this red function would be perfectly good. And it, we wouldn't necessarily know it's the inverse of the green function. And our favorite kind of generic variable in math is x. So we recklessly just say, hey, it's a function, even though it's a reverse of some other function, it still takes the generic input of x. So let's look at this in terms of green. So if we have a value in the domain of f, let's pick x equals 3. And so over here to the side, we'll, well, actually up here, we'll draw a little picture, just like we did before. And this is the domain of f and the range of f. And f moves inputs out of the domain and, and turns them into outputs in the range. And so if we put the input of 3 in, so we've got 3 over here. 3 is going to go to, well, uh, f 
of 3 equals 2 times 3 plus 1. So f of 3 equals to 7. So it's going to map 3 over to 7. And what we have is we have that this is in the domain of the original function, x equals 3. And I'm deliberately leaving x's and y's off here. And then the output is in the range of f, my original function. So let's reverse it. Now let's reverse. Let's reverse things here. Now we're working with our inverse function. So in the, oops, let's start this way. Let's say, okay, in the range of f, we have um, seven. So inverses, that means in the domain of f inverse, we have seven as an input. So f inverse is going to reverse the relationship and take the output of the original function, seven, put it into the inverse and give us, well, we could do the math, seven minus one over two gives us, seven minus one is six divided by two is three. And so three is the output of our inverse. So it's in the range of our inverse and seven is the input of our inverse. And so it's the domain of our inverse. So let's now label these pictures as the same thing over here can also be thought of as the domain of the inverse, which is going to take and map those values using our inverse function to its range of f inverse. A lot of times this part can be challenging for students to think about the inputs and outputs reversing. Um, so we're going to stop this here and then we'll, we'll get more into finding inverses in the next video.